1939, Germany's fastest pre-war electric locomotive would roll out of AEG, designed to travel at 180 km per hour in everyday service, with the potential to go even faster. Designed for high-speed tests at up to 225 km per hour, these were the strongest and fastest single-frame locomotives in its heyday, and they would not be matched for another 25 years. So how did we get to this locomotive? And quite interestingly, why isn't this more famous? Well, let's get into that. My name is Jamie, and let's get into this locomotive deep dive. If you are interested in further history of electric locomotives, do subscribe and like this video, as I will be doing episodes like this weekly. Next week's episode, we will go down into the downfall of the New York Central and its merger into Penn Central while going into its final electrics such as the R-Class and the P-Class, so don't forget to subscribe. While Germany was no stranger to electric traction, as the first electric traction passenger services would date back to 1881, with Germany recovering from the economic depression of the 1930s, the Deutsche Reichsbahn would push for more electrification all around Germany at 15 kV 16 and a half AC. As a bid to improve its express passenger services in between Berlin and Munich, the precursor to the EA-19 was developed, named the E-18. They would be built to speed up their express services across Germany, wanting to push speeds above 120 km per hour. To achieve this top speed, the A18 would be streamlined compared to previous electric locomotives such as the E04 or E17. Replacing the old boxy front with a smoother front to hopefully reduce the air resistance. Building on a 1D1 wheelset, this would achieve a service speed of 150 km line speed and the E18 would be capable of pulling a 935 ton train at 140 km at track level. It would also have a total output of 2,840 kilowatts, with a tap controller controlling the current flowing into the motors. The E18 would also be one of the first electric locomotives with a seat for the driver or engineer in Germany. The E18 would be incredibly successful, with 61 would be built pre-war and an additional two would be built from destroyed E18s post-war. These E18s would achieve 165 km per hour top speed during tests. And these E18s would also be the Deutsche Reichsbahn's second fastest electric locomotive. The fastest was the E19. This brings us directly to the E19. The Deutsche Reichsbahn wanted faster locomotives for the berlin hall munich route with a top speed of 180 km per hour, with a speed of 60 km per hour on the gradients of the Franconian Forest Railway. The Franconian Forest Railway is incredibly steep. The ramps at Presig, Rothenkirchen and Prozella to Steinwald have an incline of 2.9%. One important point for the E19 project was to allow for a higher top speed if required. The E19 would be based on an existing E18 and overall could be seen as a modernized version of the E18. They would have the same length and overall, at a glance, they would look almost identical. However, the E19 would be of welded construction. That while well, it doesn't sound like a big deal, it was. Most engines at the time were of a riveted construction. And another big change from the previous iterations would be the control gear. The E19 would only have 20 control steps while the previous would have 29. They would also have much, much more power compared to the previous E18. They would have a continuous rating of 3,700. One thing that stopped the E19 project from truly succeeding, regardless of the war, was simply brakes. To explain further, we must explain home and distance signals. Home signals can show a proceed or a stop indication. They exist 
to protect a risk. That risk may be something like a turnout or a crossing. Distant signals are caution signals. The only two indications you may ever see on a distant is a proceed or a caution. It cannot show a stop. In Germany, a distant signal is placed one kilometer from a home signal. For most of the rail traffic, it is a perfectly adequate warning distance. It allows a driver to stop comfortably short of the home signal. However, at high speeds, this is simply not enough and allows for instances for a driver to pass that signal at danger. The mass says that if a train was traveling at 200 km an hour, it would need more than 1.5 km of braking distance. This distance assumes that we don't have brake fade, that we are traveling on level ground, and that the driver is re acting responsibly. There are four ways to solve this problem. Multicolor lights can give more signal aspects that can potentially warn the driver. For example, we add an extra medium or a preliminary medium, as such as in New South Wales. Stronger brakes to stop the train faster, bigger distances between both signals, or in cab signaling to potentially warn the driver if the signal is at caution or at stop. To hopefully solve the braking issues, both would have an upgraded brake compared to regular locomotives. They would have an improved air brake while also having an electric brake fitted. These two things would allow for the EA19 to brake within the standards of the Deutsche Reichsbahn. However, they would not be good enough for the future Bundesbahn. The E19.1 were a separate subclass built by Siemens and Henschel which were different to the regular E19s built by AEG. One notable difference to the eye is the hump on the roof compared to the E19. The E19.1 would have an improved electric brake compared to the E19, and therefore needed that larger hump on the roof to contain it. Another difference in the Siemens variant would be the modified version of the control gear, which would have 57 steps, allowing the driver to regulate the motors more specifically compared to both the E19 and E18. However, due to the start of the Second World War, further tests were cancelled and the E19s were not given a chance to see their true potential. As such, their speeds were only capped to 180 km per hour. After the war, all four locomotives would be found in West Germany and would later be used by the West German successor to the Deutsche Reichsbahn. This successor would be known as the Deutsche Bundesbahn, or as people know it better as DB. E1901 and E1912 would be immediately put back into service in 1945, immediately after the war ends. E1902 would run again in 1947, and E1911 would fare the worse, as it would be severely damaged by the war, where it would have to be fixed by Kraus Maffei and EAW Munich Freiman. They would be rebuilt with a different gearing and motors, which would result in 140 km h top speed to help with the steeper grades of this Franconian railways. All the side skirts would be removed by 1954. These four locomotives would be sent to the Nuremberg depot, where they would be used between Nuremberg and Propsila, which was in East Germany, and they would also be used for Nuremberg to Regensburg Despite being a class of only four locomotives, they would be kept on the roster for a very long time, due to it sharing a lot of parts with its more successful predecessor, the E18, and due to it being incredibly fast. Even when the E10s arrived in 1956 with a top speed of 150 km, the E18s and E19s would remain in mainline passenger service until the BR-103s or E-03s would start to arrive in mass in the 1970s, that they would be downgraded to regional passenger service. So what remains of the E-19s? Are they condemned to their history books as another waste of potential? Will two out of the four still survive to this day? 
E1912 survives in the Nuremberg Transport Museum, and E1901 is stationed at the German Museum of Technology. Despite not being iconic themselves, they would be the genesis for one of the most iconic locomotives ever built. Originally, plans existed to build an updated version of the E19, occurred in the 1950s. However, as a bid to build a new express locomotive that could travel at 100 km per hour or more, it was noticed that the E19 was outdated and the brakes were simply not good enough. However, the locomotive that would be eventually be built would be known as the famous E03, or the BR103, also famous for the Trans-European Express. So, I'll leave that famous locomotive for another video. So what are my thoughts on the E19? Simply, that's incredible in nearly every metric. Despite all the coolness, it has been ignored for many reasons, such as a wrong time, wrong place. And quite simply, it didn't look imposing or iconic enough. It would be ignored since many may think of this era for the steam engines, such as the imposing O1 or O3s, in the streamlining with the black and red livery or ignored for the later electrics such as the E10 in the Rheingold scheme, or the BR103. I do think I'll try and see them next time I visit Germany, though. Today, that is all we will cover. Next time, on this topic of electrifying the East Coast, I will discuss how the New York Central continues its electrification project. I will also be exploring the 20th Century Limited going through the mode of power, but also the history and development of the characters themselves. Thank you for watching this episode of Pan Up, a series of where we explore the history of East Coast electrics. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video, as it does help me out in getting these videos to more people. I just want to say thank you to my viewers and to my partner for su supporting me. So I hope you enjoyed cri this video, and I wish you a happy holidays as we slowly draw towards our great Christmas.